So as you all know, we have tons of forest land here in western Montana. And some people choose to live in areas like this, where they're surrounded by thousands and thousands of acres of timberland, which brings in the reason for this video this week. We're going to talk about how to defend yourself against wildfires. And believe it or not, there is a way to build a house out here in these types of areas that can survive a major wildfire, even if the fire department doesn't show up. We're gonna meet with some experts from the Montana DNRC and some other fire experts and insurance experts and talk about what they look for in order to protect your house, what you can do to protect your house. And at the end, we'll also show you the house that is being built right now that could withstand one of these major wildfires. So usually when a landowner calls and I go and get their address and I plug it into Google Earth or whatever, and I take a look at the aerial imagery of their address, and I start looking at um, continuity of forest, I start looking at road systems, I start looking at fire history, we consider predominant wind directions. So, you know, what direction do our historic fires, what direction have they come from? Okay. Come from the west generally speaking. Okay. The large fires, what we see on the landscape, especially up here in the North Fork, generally from the west southwest. So that's what I look at. And then as we do our drive in and we start looking at road width, is it 12, 14, is it wider? Is it dirt? Is it paved? What is the clearance of the vegetation along the roadsides? Is it shrubby? Is it dense timber? Um, do there are there ladder fuels? So that's what we're looking at when we look at access. Why and then do you care about the width? Access in for responders okay. who are going to be coming in in some sort of apparatus, different sized. In a fire situation where it's smoky, people are stressed out. There's adrenaline. Um, you're going to have people trying to evacuate, uh -huh. trying to exit, while you've got responders coming in. Okay. So having that the the width there for people to get in and out okay. safely. Is important. Okay. I know from an insurance perspective, access yeah. is a huge ah. uh, factor in the insurability of a property. Okay. Because we are concerned with how easily can the fire department yes. come up to the structure and defend the structure yes. from a complete loss. Yes. Like so. we were talking about the trees on either side. Okay. Sometimes that's access. Sometimes taking a few trees out to at least allow vehicles in okay. is the difference. Okay. It may not mean like actually widening the driveway. Okay. I mean, that's... we've got good examples here of a few trees that are within, say, a 12-foot yeah. um, area. And in this situation, it's relatively flat, but if you can imagine, like you were saying, those windy, mm -hmm. like mid-slope, kind of switchbacky, accessing properties that are positioned higher on a slope, that's a different situation, too. That, you're probably not going to be able to change the width of your driveway very much. Right. So we have to think about a lot of different situations. Okay. What is the slope within 150 feet? So that's a pretty... Big range. Pretty pretty big range, but that's looking at how is fire gonna move? You know, there's a little drainage, there's a little bit of slope downhill. Um, so just recognizing we're not on flat, it's not super steep, we're sort of moderate, moderate. here. And, and I would say from an insurance perspective, um, yeah. the slope of the property is also one of the factors, factors that can increase the cost okay. because fire runs uphill yes and you could be a mile from the responding fire department but that might not be enough time if you're on a slope that's yep. dr kiln dry and fire is running up um, towards yes. the structure okay so here we're looking at the roof material is it metal or tile so we're saying is it or asphalt comp composition shingles so is it non-combustible mm -hmm. and we have these large trees mm -hmm. and we have little needles mm -hmm. that blow and get into the little um, overlaps. What do you call those? The the corrugated ribs. Yeah, where they can get in there yep. over years, yep. and then they dry out, yep. and then the embers get in the same way, yep. and then they burn. Yep. So, um, Rick, our friend Rick Trembath has some photos from fires where you know they they were able to look and see how how the ridge mm -hmm. started. And it had to do with the leaves and or the needles um, over time. 
but yeah. I see right here yeah. examples where the screws are coming up yes. and then everything you just talked about, if this gets more severe, more prominent, you can actually get needles and things to yeah. catch underneath that yeah. um, and, and be that source of accelerant or, or ignition, excuse me. Yeah. So we could say, yep, check, metal roof. Mm -hmm. But then when you take a closer look and, it, and you see those openings that you're talking about and mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not closed off mm -hmm. and there, there is no flashing, we go straight to the... Flashing is a big thing, isn't it? It is a big thing. Especially, now I noticed that they don't have gutters here, but that's the number one place for a fire to ignite, right? Often, yes, Often. because if there are gutters and we do have conifers or... Um, and we've, we've lost leaves and needles and they get in the gutters and they're sort of out of sight, out of mind a lot of times. We, mm -hmm. we maybe not don't clean them out as frequently as we should. Mm -hmm. And again, those are fine fuels that bake in the sun. It gets to be August. Those are uh, receptive to ignition. So um, the majority of structures lost in fire are lost due to that those embers, those swirling embers and fire brands uh, um, that blow out in advance of a fire. Okay. So it's not always, it's not the flaming front, but it's the embers. And it's the embers that land and ignite the debris, the needles, the leaves that are cured and ready to go okay. in the gutters and around the perimeter. What do the eaves look like? Are they, are they boxed in? Are they closed in or are they open? And this has to do with sort of heat coming up again, embers. Um, so we have open eaves here. We do have open eaves. And again, no flashing. Because a lot of times we say log construction, you know, like when we're starting a fire, do we start with heavy fuel? No. So usually log construction in good condition is not a it's, huge concern. It's, it's actually, it's a very good material yeah. to fight fire because it's, to your point earlier about the gutters, it's the small stuff mm -hmm. that hits the embers right. that creates ignition. Yeah. An ember wall could hit this and fall to the ground. So then you yes. start to look at right the ground around it. Yes. Correct? Okay. But again, Rick Trambath has has pictures and videos where embers have accumulated in here. Uh -huh. And this is where it starts to smolder. Okay. So, you know, we talk about fuel moistures and in August when it's fire season, the fuel moisture, it's dry. It's really dry. And so when the embers come in, these little nooks and crannies, and they accumulate, and it sits and smolders, and then this is what could start the structure on fire. Okay. So Rick's got some pictures where they've, you know, taken, like the firefighters come in, they're able to get there in time, they can catch it, and then they just, they can cut that off and save a structure just from that. Otherwise, it would just sit there and smolder and, and ignite the home eventually. Okay. So some chinking would be ideal right there to fill in those gaps. Yeah, yeah. We're thinking about embers blowing in. Okay. Um, we talk about where, where do the leaves and the needles accumulate? Those are where the embers are going to be. Okay. Where does the snow accumulate? Mm -hmm. In that first snow, that snow, those are the winds that are going to come. That's where places, those are the places where, where embers would accumulate as well. And so I have talked to people about that very thing. Mm -hmm. To be thinking about forest fire mm -hmm. in January, mm -hmm. when we have a light, fluffy, dry snow falling, mm -hmm. where are the little drifts yeah. aggregating around the home yeah. because that's where likely embers also of the yeah. same weight would sort of yeah. collect leaves needles leaves needles and yep. then embers yep yes okay so keeping it clean in fact one of the things um jack cohen in one of his presentations said doing post-fire investigations out in california was um the homes that were left standing had for sale signs in front of them nah. and he gives you a moment just to think about it and you're like oh because what do you do when you're going to sell your home? It's all cleaned up. Yeah, clean it up. Exactly. Right here. What we're looking for is a three to five foot non-combustible perimeter. Okay. All the way around the structure. So that's great. We've got both of those, the vertical and the horizontal right here, non-combustible. Again, embers coming in, not igniting anything. Right. And then we talked about vents and the screens should be, um, they found that 16th is too small, 16 inches, too small for ventilation quarter inch is too large, embers get in. Okay. So they've sort of settled on this um, one eighth inch. Okay. A, a lot of times we see wood mulch. Yeah. 
right? We see wood mulch and there's science on wood mulch. You know, is it a cedar? Is it a coconut? Is it a big um, ponderosa pine bark mulch? All have different um, burn characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, but unless they're wet, unless they're irrigated, mm -hmm. unless, I mean, they're all going to be receptive to ignition at some point. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's the mulch factor and then there's the, the juniper factor, right? So people like to plant these junipers, which are highly volatile just because of the oils and the way that they... Oh, sure. Right? Any yep. conifers, like anytime yep. you take a conifer branch and you put it on a campfire, what happens? Yeah. You know, it pops and it sizzles and it, spends, it mm -hmm. sends embers up into the air. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. And you just don't want to plant those right up next to your structure. Right. What we're looking at is like a 30-foot buffer all around the home. We say it's lean, clean, and green, um, where we just have created that, what they call defensible space. Mm -hmm. But when you hear the word defensible, you're thinking somebody will be there to defend. And what we like to say is it's survivable space. You have done a work enough work ahead of time that if a fire does come through, mm -hmm. nobody needs to be there to defend your structure. Mm. It will survive mm -hmm. on its own. So we're about to venture into the next layer beyond mm -hmm. 30 feet mm -hmm. and talk about... Kind of the 30 to 100 feet. Yep. So within that 30 feet, when we say, do we have deciduous trees? Those are broadleaf. Those are, do we have aspen, maple, something that's not a conifer because mm -hmm. they're just less susceptible to carrying fire. Do we have a mixed forest or do we have like a conifer forest? Do we have dug fir, larch, lodgepole, any of our sort of kind of native Montana conifer forest? Um, and then we say good separation or is it continuous? So is there separation between the crowns, 10 feet maybe, or is it continuous? Like okay. would, it, would it be susceptible to that crown fire, okay. fire behavior. Um, and then we look at ladder fuels. So what does a ladder fuel do? Allows the fire to go from that horizontal plane and go vertical. Yeah, so the ladder fuel is what allows that fire to move from the ground, from the surface, up into the crowns. Okay. So you can see where if there are trees, he's gone through here and pruned. He's taken off some of those lower limbs, so mm -hmm. there's separation between the short grass, because this has obviously been mowed. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're at the, the line here where he has stopped mowing, mm -hmm. and now we're going into snowberry and um, some little regen and knick knick and sort of our native forest floor. Um, and then even these, you can see he has also been pruning out there mm -hmm. and there is decent crown separation okay and it doesn't mean that every crown needs to be separate from another crown it means that you know there's a gap and there's a gap and there's a gap and there's a gap um you know you can have clusters of okay. trees because we're also looking at forest health nobody wants a homogenous forest so we're looking at um forest health as well do you have mixed tree species? Do you have a mixed age class? Okay. You know, we want to build like this, maintain this resilient forest structure. Okay. So that's what we're looking at as well. Because mm -hmm. we look at this, what we call the home ignition zone, mm -hmm. which is that zero to five, out to 30, out to 100 feet, mm -hmm. like all around. So what's interesting about that is there is definitely an interest in that 30 foot area mm -hmm. i've i've had homes not get insured mm -hmm. or have to go to some other riskier coverages because the trees were too close mm -hmm. so there's an analysis there but there's also a lot of big data that companies have produced um, from iso as an example that will rate this property based upon satellite imagery mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the timber around so not dissecting channels or clusters right. but just taking an average okay. of the area and then slapping a rating on it and that's what the insurance companies will okay. use okay. so it's much more mm -hmm. um, not as granular as we're about to get right to the to the good and to the bad people will ask me you know all right so I don't have a very good fire rating can I cut down a bunch of trees and improve my insurance score and the answer right. is no right because that the that resource will grow back and grow up and and become an issue again right so unless they manage it unless they manage it but 
that data is averaged across an area and then down to a specific property. So it's really, really hard to um, drive your insurance score with, with just cutting down a bunch of trees. You can't really, because we've got many other factors. We have, right, we have access. Yeah, we, we do. have slope, mm -hmm. distance to the fire department. So the density is only one of five. The reason why this is so important isn't to lower your insurance score. The reason why this is so important is that your structure survives the fire. Yeah. Because that's one less claim that the insurance company is going to pay out on, mm -hmm. which keeps the overall insurance rating for the area. Now we're in the North Fork of the Flathead River in Montana, can keep the insurance rates down in this area. So, so that was great information about how to protect an existing house. Now, let's take a look at a house that's under construction where they're using top of the line materials and methods to build this house to withstand major wildfires. Home, which we've, we've looked at the old structure, but now we'd like to look at the new structure. This is what, what I would call a survivable building. It, 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 in all likelihood, it won't even need defense during a wildfire. And that's because it's been built from the ground up uh, with the concern about wildfire and, and wildfire you know, vulnerability at every choice in construction and building material. Um, uh, everything from the, if I start at the foundation and look up, we're, what we see is, is about a five to six foot uh, bed of exposed gravel. And the homeowners indicated that that's what they intend to keep here. They're gonna have decorative exposed gravel within five feet of the building. So no combustibles at all within the, uh, five feet of the exterior walls of the building. They've got about six to 12 inches of exposed foundation at a minimum there. So when embers build up at the base of walls during a, an ember shower, while a fire's burning nearby, by that those embers won't find anything to ignite okay. as you move up the walls the, the choice in siding material is just outstanding the the, you, the, uh, uh, the base of the walls the first thing you reach is a layer of metal flashing which is then is covered by a, a fiber cement product really beautiful wood looking fiber cement in fact i had to touch it to tell that it wasn't real wood um, but it's a non-combustible material. The choice of the trim at the edges of the walls, that's a non-combustible fiber cement material also. So there's just, there are no exposed combustible materials on this building at all. So this is a, this is a, the material. This, and this is the material, it's non-combustible. We could put that in the fireplace right now and we could not get it to burn. There's, a, there's nothing in there that'll burn. And it We've sounds got, like, it almost sounds like tile. It is, it's, it's you know, essentially the same type of product. It's a heavy cement fiber uh, product. Huh. The, the homeowner indicated that they made a, a conscious choice when they looked at the material to cover their soffits with. He felt that wood was the most was the nicest looking, most aesthetically pleasing choice, but they chose to use a uh, it's a powder coated aluminum uh, or steel uh, material to cover the soffits. It's non combustible. They've built it, recognizing that it needs to be tight, that there can't be any gaps that can allow embers in. So they, they were concentrating on ember resistance and and ignition resistance when they designed this part of the building it's a really vulnerable part of the building where eaves overhang any heat that gets underneath there can build up in that space and ignite the materials if you've got combustible materials like wood so normally you'd see tongue and groove you know fur underneath here but they chose not to do that and it, it looks nice and they've done an excellent job building that they've got another layer of metal flashing at the edge of the roof and a, and a class a roof which is is ignition resistant they use asphalt shingles here one of the most durable uh, you know ignition resistant materials out there you can build essentially a small campfire on that roof during a fire and it will not burn through and ignite the assembly underneath it um, so it's just, it's, it's uh, you know, from the roof foundation to the top of the roof, the building is constructed in ways that, that will resist ignition. Uh, they've got multi-pane tempered glass windows where they're exposed to the outside world, just that, uh, you know, the windows themselves are resistant and they've taken care to make sure that the windows and the walls won't be exposed to radiant heat anyway. So they've got almost a double layer of protection there. So I, I don't see any significant vulnerabilities. As we walk around the back, but the, 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 the first place, first thing you see on the building that could be of any form of concern is the exposed deck. Attachments and decks, fences can be vulnerable. But this deck is constructed, even though it's got wood joists and a wood subframe, uh, heavy timber construction, all, all of the choices that they made 
are uh, as ignition uh, resistant as possible. So everything from the choice of using full dimension lumber for the joists underneath here, the heavier the lumber, the more difficult it is to ignite. They've uh, put uh, uh, foil face bitumen on top of the joists, which protects them, uh, you know, helps them last longer, adds durability to the joists themselves for moisture protection, but it also helps protect the top of the joists, which are vulnerable when embers build up between the deck, deck boards. The embers that land on the deck can fall down. They can fall through the gaps in the deck boards where they'll land on gravel below and won't ignite anything. But if they build up on top of the joists, they can generate enough heat to potentially ignite the joists themselves. So commonly after fires, when embers have built up on decks, we'll find charring in between the deck boards on the top of the joists. This foil face uh, bitumen actually helps protect from that. Um, I, and the homeowner indicated that they chose the Trex synthetic decking board specifically for fire resistant. I, I'm not sure the specific product, but he researched the product and found the Trex decking boards that had the, the, the best rating for ignition resistance. And what we find in general is that synthetic deck materials like this are more ignition resistant. They're made with, a, with the, you know, plastic and wood fibers typically. They will burn. If you took a piece of this and put it in your fireplace, it'll ignite. And once it gets, uh, gets burning, it releases a lot of heat. They'll burn like gasoline, but they're difficult to ignite. So as long as you've taken all these extra steps, the foil facing on the, the joists, the heavy timber construction, the full dimension uh, joists underneath here, heavy timber posts like this, um, uh, wider deck, deck gap spacing than you'd normally see. This is what the IBHS is now recommending, at least a quarter inch gap between decks, where the old recommendation was an eighth of an inch uh, uh, spacing between deck boards. This is a quarter inch gap. What, what the, the research that I've seen most recently says a quarter to a half inch is better, which, which can cause some problems. Things can slide through and you can actually, you know, stub your toes between the deck boards, but it doesn't allow embers to build up between them. So this homeowner has chosen the, the absolute state of the art with, uh, you know, all of the building science, all the materials from the ground up on this building. That's why I think this building's likely to survive a fire, even, even if it doesn't have uh, fire protection necessarily, fire suppression resources assigned to it. Uh, you know, the, the, these, these materials are combustible, but you can you just think about it as if you don't have kindling to ignite heavy timber, timbers, you can't get it to burn. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you don't just take the log and put it in your fireplace and hold a match to it, it won't ignite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by building it this way, by being thoughtful about the materials that are on the ground, making mm -hmm. sure that you've used non-combustible mulches and, and ground coverings mm -hmm. like the gravel that'll be here, pushing vegetation away from the building, keeping the grasses and weeds cut. Um, I, you know, in, in this case, they've got some, some timber, some, some young trees, uh, uh, you know, and their conifers that are probably a little too close to the building. The homeowners indicated that they're aware of that and are willing to push those back a little farther from the building. But even still, they've taken measures like limbing these trees up uh, uh, from the ground, choosing a species that's among the most fire resistant of all of the, uh, the conifers that we, we have, uh, you know, locally. This is a larch. Um, the homeowner is making good concessions, good choices all around, and I think that there's good reason to believe that this building's going to survive. So Thank you for watching our video. Please call, text, or email for more information, and don't forget to watch our other videos about Montana.